this particular component talks about um, some evaluation of named data networks in a notional tactical environment. So in this particular scenario, I'm, I'm going to sort of this, this, uh, describe an environment that we looked at um, and some of the characteristics or some, some of the things that we were trying to look for from a performance perspective. Uh, and hopefully it'll shed the light on what does this look like in a, in a, in a tactical environment. Nevertheless, I want to make sure that uh, we understand that this, is, this, um, this may not answer all your questions. You know, there, there are other questions that I'm sure we will have. And that's where the discussion, the, the open discussion part, would be very important. Um, so let, let's carry on and, and, and just look at what we have looked at here. So, so first of all, just a couple things about why we think this is applicable. So the simplicity part, the, the, simplicity part, uh, the fact that um, you have, you know, as we said, applications and networks, you know, they're, they're not necessarily speaking the same language. This unifies the application and network semantics. They're all now based on names. Uh, the efficiency here is something that we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to see that using this concept of in-network caching give you a lot of power, right? Uh, in the sense that you can move the data across a disrupted link once, and if you have multiple recipients that are interested in this data, it doesn't have to traverse that link again, and that gives you a lot of efficiency. Uh, the security part, instead of having to secure end-to-end -end channels with things like I, you know, IPsec or TLS, we don't have to do that anymore. That breaks when you're talking about a disrupted environment. So the data now is secured in transit and, uh, in, um, and at rest. And so you, you don't have to worry about in, uh, you know, protecting channels anymore. Uh, the resiliency, of course, is that you don't have to couple data with location. You know, when you want data, you don't have to necessarily go to a specific location to ask, ask for it and get it. Now it is somewhere in the network. Uh, whoever has it will, will provide it. So again, why do the, we think this is applicable? Um, a lot of the applications in, in tactical networks are content-centric, right? Uh, the, again, the focus is on the data. There's a lot of sensors uh, that produce data, and there are a lot of applications that want to be able to pull this data. So in a sense, it is content-centric. Um, and so we realize that today, right? We, re we do realize that, and as, as a result of that, we're, we're putting all these overlay solutions on top of our existing network uh, just to make the data closer and make the data more available. That further complicates the data, and, and it, it's, you know, it, it's an overlay. So there is there's overhead that is associated with that, so it becomes less efficient. Um, in a lot of cases, data dissemination is one to many. So if we take, for example, a multicast saddle J, which is an application that is used by the Navy, it, it, it's multicast in nature. Um, so the fact that NDN inherently supports multicast, and you don't have to build multicast protocols on top, and, and you know, all the overhead that get associated with it, that is also um, uh, something of interest. Data analytics is making it its, its way into tactical environments. Um, again, for example, the, the Navy Tactical Cloud, they're looking into building these data analytics, um, uh, you know, a component within their network so that they can, you know, look at information that is gathered by sensors in different places and be able to um, uh, look for interesting things. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the way we have data today, there's no notion of what is in the data. You have to actually do, have some complex algorithms to go in and un understand exactly what this data is about. If you have a mechanism where you can carefully name the data using NDN, just by looking at the name, you can get a sense of what is in it. And that, again, enables things like data analytics. All right, so, um, so our evaluation is looking at, um, uh, an Air Force scenario is a notional environment um, that has um, certain characteristics that we'll look at, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to describe that. But the objective here is look at um, uh, a bunch of different protocols I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about and compare how they do um, versus something where we can run NDN. And I'm going to describe how we run NDN. We run NDN in two different flavors in that environment. We run it um, overlay over IP, and um, that, that makes sense since we already have an infrastructure that we don't want to throw away, so natively above IP, but there are also certain scenarios where we run it just st straight over layer two, just because uh, there's a lot of mobility and IP is really not going to converge from a routing perspective. So um, this is the environment, and let me try to describe the components with it. Uh, 
So uh, there are a bunch of um, aircrafts here, right? And there are a bunch of uh, um, uh, command centers. So these command centers, we have six of them. They're yellow. Um, and the objective is to be able to transfer information between the command centers and these aircrafts. Uh, to connect between the uh, command centers and the aircrafts, we have gateways. There's no direct connectivity. So there's a satellite node here. There's an aircraft that services as a gateway. There's also a Humvee here that is servicing as a gateway. For you to be able to go into, into uh, you know, pull information out of any one of these aircrafts, you're going to have to traverse at least a couple of them. So these aircrafts are, uh, we call these a friendly aircrafts. They are the ones who's going to either send or receive data from uh, the command centers. Some of the data that is generated is looking at locations of these aircrafts. These aircrafts are uh, what we call enemy aircrafts. So um, in a sense, when these aircrafts come within range of any one of these uh, enemy aircrafts, they want to send position information back to the command centers. The links that we have have varying characteristics. So for example, between these command centers, there's a 20 megabit per second link and a 25 millisecond delay just going from the command center to the satellite. Uh, and so if a, a lot of this information was, uh, as I said, it's notional, but there was input to us in terms of what these criteria are. So we didn't completely make it up. Um, between the satellites uh, and the aircraft gateway here, there's a 20 megabit per second link with a 350 millisecond delay, but you have about 10% loss on it. Uh, between the, uh, this, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the Humvee gateway and this, this command center, 20 megabit per second, five millisecond delay. Up here to that aircraft, you have a 20 megabit per second link, 25 millisecond delay. From the aircraft out to all these mobile nodes or mobile aircrafts, it's a one megabit per second link. Um, and so these aircraft are moving randomly uh, in, in, in a random manner. And we actually ex uh, experimented with a couple of different mobility scenarios, one where they're all completely random, but there are a bunch where they're sort of moving in groups. And so the data transfer, as I said, just happens back and forth. Some data that goes from the command centers to the aircrafts, and some data that goes from in the aircraft down to the command centers. So let me describe that a little, a little further. So when the data is transferred, we're looking at uh, four different mechanisms, and we're comparing against these four. So we looked at uh, TFTP, which is basically FTP over UDP I, uh, uh, over IP, uh, just because you know TCP is really not going to work in, in that kind of was that kind of the, um, with that kind of delay and that kind of loss in the network. We also looked at the NAC-oriented reliable multicast. Um, and just to describe that a little bit for those of you who don't know it, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, a protocol that provides reliability for multicast data. Um, so it's, it's sort of a pub-sub model where someone, uh, a, multi, a, gener a producer of data can multicast it out to all the uh, receivers. Um, and every single data that is multicasted out will have a sequence number. And the receivers can then identify gaps or anything that is missing. Uh, if there are gaps, they send NAC, negative acknowledgments, for them. And then they can get unicasted back to them. We also looked at the skips uh, TP over IP, which, is, as I mentioned in the first set of slides, it's a modification of TCP to make it operate better in, a, in, in an environment where there's a lot of delay. And then uh, in the end, running overlay on top of IP or uh, uh, straight over uh, uh, Ethernet. So for instance, when we're running NDN in this kind of environment, because of the frequent mobility, uh, the connectivity to this aircraft gateway is just going to be very disrupted. It, you're not going to be able to send anything, uh, or, or you're not going to be able to establish any end-to-end -end connectivity. Your routing table, in a sense, is never going to converge if you want to try to send something out from here to anywhere else. So what we do is we run NDN straight over layer two. We basically, in a sense, it's just it's broadcast, so send out. Uh, uh, you know, on that network. Uh, and uh, what will happen is that, uh, you know, it, if, it, if it makes it to the aircraft gateway, that's great. If it doesn't, someone else might be able to cache it and uh, may be able to deliver it to the uh, uh, aircraft uh, later on. Uh, so we put this in an emulation environment running for about 20 minutes in, in uh, you know, using Core, which is, a, you know, an emulation tool that is also uh, 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 out there. Um, that you know, we could basically create 
uh, emulated nodes for each one of these and run native NDN code uh, and you know, native TFTP norm, skips TP code on each one of the emulated nodes. So for file transfer, so basically what we have here is uh, there are three different types of data that are being generated. Uh, there's one where there's a large file that needs to be transferred from specifically this command center all the way up to a, a randomly generated aircraft, right? So we randomly generate an aircraft and we want to transfer a large file from that command center all the way up there. Um, these files are generated every two to three minutes. So for the duration of the runs that we have, the 20 minute runs, uh, this amounts to about, 20, uh, about uh, eight files. Each one of them is one megabytes. Um, the files are only valid for three minutes. If from the time when they're generated to the time when delivered, it took you longer than three minutes, you should not even try. You should just basically discard them and assume that they're lost. So there's, there's a strict duration of time here for the validity of that data. There's also another type of large file that goes from the same command center, but in that case, we want to multicast it out. We want to send it to all the aircraft. Uh, all, all the aircraft. It's got the same structure where um, it's generated every two to three minutes. Uh, you still have about uh, eight of them at one, megabit per, one megabytes each, and you also have the same validity of time. If, if they're not, if you don't make it to these aircrafts within three minutes, you should discard them. Um, then we have um, some small files. These small files gen generated from all command centers. They are about 15 kilobytes each, and they get sent every six seconds. And the, the objective is to send them from each one of the command centers to all the aircrafts. So some information that gets sent out to all the uh, uh, aircrafts. Um, then there's position location information. So in that case, the data is flowing in the opposite direction. We have all these aircrafts are sending position location information out to the command centers. Um, and so this is one of the scenarios where we wanted to experiment with what if we merit, what if we take an application that just does straight IP or you know, works on top of IP and then somehow in the middle of the network we can convert that into uh, something that is uh, based on NDN. So what will happen here is that the traffic, the position location information generated by these nodes will be multicasted out. And uh, then when it's, when, it's, when it's multicasted out, it's going to go as far as the network connectivity will enable it to go. But what will happen is where it stops, we're going to take it and convert it into NDN data. And so then uh, if, if the data reaches all the way to the command centers, then we're good. If some of the data doesn't and it gets stuck maybe here or here, what will happen is the command center can then go and fill in these gaps by using NDN. They can issue interests against this data and pull it down um, at, you know, to fill in any of the missing gaps. So again, the idea is I could you know, just run this application as is without any sense of uh, NDN being part of the network and the data gets sent out, but then in the network I can convert it into an NDN. I can still propagate it as multicast data over IP, but then I, I can also convert it into NDN data, and when if, if it gets lost, I can fill in some of these gaps using NDN, um, uh, you know, by, by issuing NDN interest against it. Uh, so that's, that's the third type of data. So um, I put this together to sort of, in the last minute, which is usually not a good idea, but you know, I, I figured there was a lot of questions about naming. How, do, how, do, how does naming happen here, and how do we route this? So in this kind of environment, so let's say, for example, we're looking at a large file, right? So this large file, we want to pull this large file from the commands, uh, from, um, uh, we, we want to pull this large file basically from the um, command center all the way up to the aircraft. So what will happen is that this is the name of the file. So what we can do then is we have you know, a structure that looks like the longest prefix. So if this data exists here, right, so then when, it's get, when it gets pulled, right, so what we can say is uh, some of the name, some of the uh, uh, portions of the name will be known by the aircraft, uh, by, the, um, uh, by the satellite. Um, so for example, so he, he's asking for this file, right? So in that case, um, he, 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 all he knows is that anything that has this prefix, you can ask the satellite. When the satellite gets the request, he then has more information, saying, all right, uh, I, 
this is a large file, but specifically saying aircraft. So in that case, I go that way, right? And then when it gets to the, the aircraft, then he has more information saying, all right, so this is aircraft 16. I know that I need to go that way, right? So you're basically sort of building your routing um, into the, uh, where the data is uh, by, by, by using uh, longest prefix matching. So in this, in, in this example, it'll work just because um, it's, it's a small environment, right? We don't, I don't have tons and tons of data, so I can basically, uh, or, or tons of tons of tons and tons of nodes, so I can basically um, have some of these naming uh, basically, um, uh, you know, set up ahead of time and statically configured uh, in the network, and, and that's how we did it here. All right, so uh, from the perspective of mobility, as I said, these, these guys move randomly. Um, there's a lot of disruption in the network, so these links here, uh, they are out every, uh, for two minutes every five minutes, completely disconnected. There is no traffic flowing between them. Uh, these nodes here, the aircraft and the Humvee, they are out for 30 seconds every two minutes. Uh, there's no uh, connectivity at all within that uh, time window. Um, there are also 10% uh, packet loss here, and there's also 10% uh, packet loss on this, um, um, you know, within this mobile network. All right, so these are some of the things that we were looking at. Um, for, for, for the files that we're delivering, what is the file delivery ratio? How much of the files are we able to deliver? How long does it take? Um, and also, these links, because um, they are um, uh, they are frequently disrupted, um, and um, you know they sort of form as the core connectivity component between all these endpoints. Um, how much data are we pushing across these links, right? Um, so it would be really nice if I can push less data but deliver more data, right? Um, so that's one of the things that we're going to look at: the transport efficiency. How much am I moving across these links, right? And how much data am I delivering to end nodes? And that's gonna highlight some of the benefits of the in-network caching because one request for one file from here, if it gets cached up there, the next request for it don't have to traverse that link anymore. You can just grab it from a closer cache. And that, that doesn't necessarily have to be a satellite. It could be, you could have some, some node here in the middle that serves that exact same purpose. So here are some of the results, the, the results that we looked at. Uh, so in, in, from the perspective of the file delivery ratio, um, so we had large files and small files. Large files were one megabyte each, um, and there were uh, there about uh, you know, 16 of them that, that, that get sent total. Um, so in, in the end-to-end -end scenario, where we're running it over um, IP. In a sense, you know, it's file, file delivery over IP. I was able to deliver about 92%. Uh, got nothing from the rest of the protocols because of the end-to-end -end connectivity and you, because you, your inability to be able to do that, uh, it basically failed. It couldn't deliver anything at all. Uh, I, so if I look at the same thing with respect to small files, we had about 900 files that are being sent that are small, 15 kilobytes each. Because of the physics of the connectivity, it was not possible to get enough time to be able to move all that data across. So nevertheless, nevertheless we're, you know, with, 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 an, with NDN running, running on top of IP, it was about 56% of the data uh, delivered. The, uh, the, the rest of the protocols, with the exception of NORM, were very low. So NORM was good because it's multicast and because of, you know, you send the data out once and it gets received by multiple recipients. So that's, that was good in, in, you know, um, from a file delivery uh, perspective. But we'll see that what will, um, uh, you know, when we're looking at the delay, uh, NDN is going to play. Um, it's going to have much better delay values, just because when data gets lost using norm, you still have to do end-to-end -end negative acknowledgments, um, and um, and uh, that that causes an increase in delay. When we're looking at a file delivery delay for for these large files, is about. Uh, two and a half minutes or so. So the window of time that we had was three minutes. Uh, if it's outside of that bound, then you throw it away. So most of the files were delivered within uh, two and a half minutes. Uh, again, none of the other protocols delivered anything, so there was no sense of calculating delay there. 
uh, for the uh, for the small files, uh, 12.8 seconds for uh, NDN. The closest from the file delivery ratio was norm, and that was uh, about 88 seconds or so for the delivery of these files. Again, as, I, as I explained, it's because of the end-to-end -end negative acknowledgement versus the ability to do in-network caching. When you lose something, you don't have to go all the way to get it from the uh, producer. You could get it from the closest point where it stopped. Uh, that's where it's going to reside. So from the efficiency perspective, so I was looking at, you know, we're looking at these links. So these links get disrupted a lot. Uh, we had 20 megabit per second here. These, these were the values that we were given, but you can actually make these a lot smaller than that, right? So um, we, we, uh, um, we, uh, so we've run it with one megabit per second. We've run it with 512 kilobit per second. We've, we ran it with a, a bunch of, you know, uh, different scenarios with much smaller numbers and similar delay, uh, similar loss. Um, I have to ask, I'm, I'm processing quite slow, uh, but your ephemeral files, are they, do they also include the, the position updates or, or the, the files from the aircrafts? Because you had small files that you sent out from, from right. the aircraft no. stations and no. then you had the... Uh, right. The small files are only the small files. So the, 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 the position location from the aircraft, I have not presented the slides there. That's, okay. that's coming up next. My quest, next question is not valid yet. Okay. Right. <laughs> So these are just the 15 kilobyte files that go from command centers to the um, aircrafts. So you know, I was saying that these are 20 megabit per second, but we scaled them down to. Uh, so we we have a demo of some of these uh, some you know a similar environment here at the MITRE booth later on if you're interested in looking at it. But we can scale this to 512 kilobit per second, 256 kilobit per second. We can increase the delay to up to five minutes. Um, no, sorry, not five minutes. <laughs> five seconds, we can introduce loss in the network and still do a comparison, right, between what you get out of file transfer over IP versus uh, when you're doing it at, over NDN, and it still does much better. Um, I'm presenting this with the numbers that we have here just because these are the numbers that we were given. Uh, but the efficiency perspective is here looking at total amount of data delivered uh, to the aircrafts, right, uh, versus how much did I move over these links. So obviously with NDN I moved less because of the in-network caching component. The, the impression I have is that everything goes in this scenario comes from the that you are caching there, not from NDN. So all these mechanisms in naming data and giving addresses and so on. The content development uh, network also work with this idea of caching and they are not changing the network from there. Oh, you're talking about uh, content distribution networks? Right, but the difference is that content distribution networks, that's overlay, mm -hmm. right? And this is, um, um, they are application specific, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think they cost a lot more. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about that. A few more items. So content delivery networks require DNS. Mm -hmm. DNS requires infrastructure. And uh, DNS has to do a lot of uh, heavy lifting of dispatching this request to the proper CDN boxes. So where is the DNS in, the, in this environment where it cannot even transfer a small file end to end? So that's kind of where the NDN power of this pre-established naming convention is coming from. You know what you're requesting. You're getting to somewhere where this data potential is and you got it. You don't need to depend on any kind of infrastructure to get something. But the network is such infrastructure. I'm not, yeah, I mean, I think CDNs are trying to do something similar, right? But they're, without changing the network, without, you know, keeping it the, the way it is. I think maybe in a short term that makes sense, but if, if you're looking long term, uh, moving towards a direction like NDN, I think, would make more sense just because it becomes the core functionality within the network as opposed to having to come up with solutions that runs overlay to it. What, what kind of strategy are you using here in, in case you send a request for a packet and you don't get something back? Uh, do you then decide to go right. out on the more interfaces or to just assume that it's being lost? I will try the same path. Right, so that's a, that's a good question. So we tried two things. So it was that one scenario we tried where uh, if you send a request for the data and it doesn't come, after a little while you ask for it again, right? And you keep doing that. Same, same strategy. Right, just, yeah, well, so in, in that case, there were, 
in, in, in this case, there were not really a lot of strategies because it's only one link up, right? But you could adjust the strategy, you know, saying that if I can't get it sending across this link, I can flood it, right? That's one way to do it. Or maybe I can ask someone else. But we have not played with that. The other thing that we played with was um, uh, having some of these nodes act as proxies in the sense that if I request the data and because of their um, stateful forwarding, they can tell if a data comes back or not, right? So what they do is they, on their own, they can resend the interest uh, or the request for the data, right? How big were the caches big enough for all the data? Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about that. So we have three different scenarios where one was, it was all big enough for all the data, one was 50% and one was about 25%. And even if it was 25% of the total data, we still beat everybody. Um, so, uh, so obviously the, the point of this is that efficiency is, is much better. You're, moving, you're delivering more and you're moving less. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's great. So this is, the, if, this is the caching slide. So this is how much caching we had uh, at the end of the entire scenario, how much data was in caches of uh, the satellite node, the aircraft node, the, uh, the Humvee gateway, and all the aircrafts combined, right? And that's in megabytes. So we took this and we slashed it by half. We slashed it by, 20, by 75%, only 25% of that amount was there. And we were still able to do uh, outperform everybody, or NDN in a sense, was, was, was able to outperform everybody. So back to your question about this position location information. So, so in, in that, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask one more question on this. Yeah. Uh, or maybe it was because you said uh, that for the small files, you just didn't have enough capacity to get everything. Connectivity. Ah, connectivity. So it was not that you filled your pipes. It was... Okay. So, so the, the reason why I didn't get all the small files is because I stopped my run at 20 minutes, right? Yeah. The physical connectivity within that time window, I could not get more than about 60% or so. But, but okay, the question is still valid. If you then reduce the, because I was kind of curious, if, if you reduce the amount of traffic, would you then probably receive everything within that time window, or would something not be lost due to some other reasons that the data could not be found? So reduce the amount of traffic, meaning reduce the link capacities or link data rates? Reduce the amount of traffic. Oh. You have enough, you have more time to, to, get, to get the correct traffic. Right. There would still be loss. I mean, the links that I have, some of them are down for two full minutes, right? So I'm going to issue interests, and I'm not going to get data in response. Yeah, but then the trouble is that you don't get any time. Right, so in that case, well, so for the small files, there were no time restriction. For the large files, they were. That's why they were fewer. Um, but yes, if there were more disconnections in the network, or if I increased the number of files that I had to get within that time window, I may have created more congestion in the network, and it may have affected my results. Good question. So the caching you're using, assuming that all nodes in the network can cache? So that, that's, that's also a good question, yes. So in some runs, we assumed everybody can cache. In other runs, we assumed aircrafts don't cache. None, not at all. Right, which is, I think is reasonable. The only exception was the gateway. So we said, you know, maybe that aircraft gateway that is just hanging out uh, and establishing the connectivity between the aircraft and the rest of the network, we said we will have caching in there. Um, and so we, we did some runs with that. And definitely still improvements. When you have caching on the individual aircraft, did you, did you find that they, they enabled connectivity back to the gateway? Was there multi-hop amongst them? They did multi-hop against them, right. Um, so to give you more specifics, so this was running straight over layer two, right? So we were using efficient broadcast to basically have them, you know, broadcast packet, I got it, uh, and do duplicate suppression. Have I received this or not before? If I have, then I'm not gonna forward it. If I have not, then maybe forward it out. So using simplified multicast forwarding, if some of you are familiar with what that is. What was your MTU? Uh, it was a standard 1500. You will be exploring, you know, the caching above SMM, right? Yes. 
And if you cache in multiple places, suppose the packet meets some other place and then you know, request it. Do you have a mechanism that only one of them replies or all of them send that? Let's say you know, the packet is stored, the content is stored in five places, somebody meets it, who sends it back? Right, so if, if it's missed, then a bunch of people will receive it. Um, so that's a good question. I don't think we restricted other people from replying. I don't think we did that. All right, so, so, so moving forward to this. So this is position information coming from aircraft down to the command centers. Um, so initially, it was all over IP multicast. And with that only, I was able to get close to 70% of the data delivered. The missing pieces, because they were cached as NDN -end components within the network, I was, we were able to have the command centers go issue requests against them and, and bring them, uh, you know, just, just basically pull them from the network. And that gave us the remaining amount of data. So in a sense, we were able to get close to 100% of all by having that kind of architecture. And the objective here is to show that um, I can still take an, you know, a, a, an application as is and run it and be able to come up with clever ways to make it benefits from some of the uh, functionalities Indian brings to the table without having to recode or without having to reconfigure the application itself. Um, and so this is just, so that's, uh, this is w one of the ways we did it there. We, so we basically came up with this concept of a, an IP to NDN gateway where you could actually take IP traffic and convert them into NDN by, um, uh, but, you know, through configuration. So you could basically, you know, say, you know, if a packet comes in with that structure, I want to convert it to NDN, and this is how I do it. Uh, how do we do it? Uh, you could basically base it on some of the header information. You could actually have it do some, you know, deep packet inspection to figure out what the data is, and then build an NDN packet uh, out of it. And we've tried this with some applications um, to run them as is and inject this component uh, you know, as close as possible to them and tell it how do we want to modify what we're getting over an IP network into an Indian, an Indian environment. And uh, this is one of the applications that we ran against this, this concept, which is cursor and target. Generates data over UDP, which um, are, are basically, uh, you know, sensory information in nature. Uh, so we, we were able to take it and run it in, in that kind of envi environment. Um, and, you know, with similar kinds of disruptions, uh, strictly over just an IP network, and you know, uh, with that uh, NDN gateway running in uh, in the middle. And you see here, these are some of the received information. Uh, uh, you know, we're just running over uh, an IP, um, we're running over IP versus when we're running it over NDN. That that's how much we're generated. Uh, this is how much we're received over IP. We were able to get everything. Uh, when we run that over NDN. And the applications didn't change. None of it changed. We were just, you know, putting this thing in the middle and having, uh, having it um, translate IP packets into NDN packets. Um, so that's, that's the end of my set of slides. I know I have not answered all the questions because I, I think people have wanted to, you know, there's a lot of things that they've been thinking about from the perspective of how, how is this going to work in, in a tactical environment. Um, but I'm hoping that some of these questions would come up as part of our um, discussions um, in, in the last segment. But for now, I, I can take a few questions if there are any. In the image, all the comparisons in your NDN section, how much of that was straight out of box code base that you were talking about versus stuff you added on top of it? Because I imagine Norm and the TCP equivalents are they were, were kind of just straight, as easy as you can, clients, if you will. We didn't change anything with the exception of the case when we had um, some of the gateways act as proxies. It's instead of having the client retransmit the request, we have them re, re That's the only thing we changed. Uh, other than that, we did not modify any, anything at all in the end uh, forwarding. Did they act as proxies for the norm, the norm use case as well? Um, or just in the end? No, they didn't. So, but I did not provide that data because it wouldn't make sense to do the comparison then. Uh, this data was based on no proxy. If there's something lost, it goes from end to end. But I, I'm able to do that to make things even better. Okay. okay. I can say this is very far for, uh, for uh, file transfer and so on, but I'm um, kind of curious, what about applications that uh, have hard read time uh, requirements? Uh, to foresee if you can use the NDN for that as well? Is there an approach to 
Or? Right, so that I, I, I get asked that question a lot, but I'm, I'm going to lean on you guys maybe to help out with that. Um, the notion of real time in an environment like this, I don't know how to, I don't know how to interpret that. When you're talking about things, a lot of loss and a lot of delay and, and a lot of disruption, what does it mean for a real time? You know, I was comparing against all these and I got things as fast as I could, right? Is, if that's not real time enough, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what else to do, right? Maybe there are other technologies that would give them faster that do things better, but from our perspective, this got the least delay. I, I don't know if you want to, us to address in real time. So fundamentally, there's a physical resources, right? Like, like Timer said, <clears throat> if the resources are limited, I think the only thing you can do about real time against the others is prioritize. And the end <coughs> provides you that uh, support by, by the naming. Uh, you, you can put some special marks on the high priority and real time data. In the so um, there's a multiple answers there. Uh, normally, you can support that through kind of a pop up thing. That is, the, the soldiers, if expecting uh, commands, they actually have this uh, uh, subscription request, so command will come down. Or otherwise, you can actually use the interest packet. If the command is not humongous, you can use the interest packet, send command, but just like a request. Um, we build the IoT applications. When you say turn the light on, turn light off, those command actually is implemented in the interest packet. If we call the command interest. So there's another kind of a religion to say the interest only requests data. You can put any words in, into the interest. And so therefore, if the interest carries a command, the reply carries acknowledgment to, to tell you whether it's command executed successfully or otherwise was the error that it caused. So for real-time traffic, I think you're probably using voice Real time just says that there's a deadline to deliver this data that we've tried on okay, as opposed to prior time. Right. right. So in which case then it's you know, how would you how would you implement a QoS mechanism on top of this? And so if that's if the QoS is implemented at the network layer, um, then then you can have mechanisms for being able to do the, the labeling of traffic with, with your various QoS parameters at the network layer. That is, it can be I imagine some of your problem to to name the data or I don't know, the mechanism for the actual leverage and naming of the data because it's you literally can use parts of the names to de define a policy for QA. So you can explicitly you know, have something like that in there, and then that gets translated to the network layer, so you can do prioritization of some sort of you're saying something about um, how, how IT would be reliable, I think that the scenario presupposes that the, the layer one is broken. So the IT in that case would run you and get to the destination. And then well, that's what well, I was saying. So I took a lot of time from 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 Alex's time slot, but maybe one more question. So just, yeah, like the, 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 when we receive when you make these updates slide available, and, and number two, the examples that you use is that documented in any way? The results under the notes in the slide is it in a little report or a flip uh, So some of it is, but some of it is not. Uh, and I can share what we have written up that is, of course, publicly released uh, with you. If you, you know, we can communicate after, and I can share some of that with you. Um, it's, it's quite high. Right, I, I, I agree with you. But I was given numbers, and I ran it against these numbers. But as I said, I, I, we can show you this in the demo. 
I can scale down the link to 56 kilobit per second and I can induce a lot of loss on it, two or three, minute, uh, three second loss and also some packet loss and do the same kind of comparison, it's still going to do better. It's actually, it's actually going to be... Right, so yes, that's, I agree with you. It's, it's quite high. And the advantage of it when you actually have... Um, uh, when you have uh, when you have when you have smaller links, and when you actually also have um, uh, you introduce errors into the links, is that um, uh, I with this. Uh, it, it gets better over time. So at, at some point, when you when you're looking at the comparison um, between both, you can see that everything that you needed in the network has already been asked for. From that point on, everything that you're trying to pull will get it from a cache. So then it goes maybe higher in comparison to other IP applications. But once you consume, once you, once you, most of the data you want is already in the cache, all of a sudden it goes sort of vertical, right? Um, but I guess the assumption here was that we had enough cache. If you had less cache, then you're going to get more churn. Um, 